Good afternoon. My name is Thomas Forsberg. I'm director of Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. Before our uh, Jaina Aato Serkko visiting Professor Molly Andrews will be introduced to you, let me say a couple of words on the, uh, on the Collegium and the professorship. It is nice to see so many alumni and other friends of Collegium here. But for those who would not know, the Collegium is an independent institute of the University of, U of, the University of Helsinki, founded in 2001 after the internationally recognized model of institutes for advanced study um, to foster interdisciplinary research curiosity-driven interdisciplinary research in the humanities and social sciences. Collegium is one of the most internationalized units of the university. Currently, we are hosting around 40 researchers representing various nationalities and career stages from postdoc to full professors. For our call for next year's fellowships, we received again more than 300 applications from all over the world. I am also proud to announce that in the recent research assessment of the university that was conducted last spring and the result of which were announced in September, the Collegium received a grade excellent both for the quality of research as well as for the research environment. Jane and Artus Erko visiting professorship in studies of contemporary society was donated to the, um, uh, to the um, university and the collegium by the Jane and Sato, Arto Serco Foundation 10 years ago. And this scheme has been a true success. The aim of the professorship is to focus on themes of topical significance to contemporary society and social justice including the future of the welfare society, globalization, cultural conflicts, pluralism, and environmental issues. The scope of the field may also include research on the cultural and historical background of themes concerning contemporary society. This flagship professorship at the Helsinki Collegium has been able to attract year after year distinguished world-class scholars representing different interdisciplinary research orientations. The role of ERCO professors in stimulating research, building community and creating prestige during their stay has been immense. Molly Andrews is Professor of Political Psychology at the University of East London. Her research project here focuses on East German memory politics. In less than three weeks' time, it will be 30 years since the Berlin Wall was opened. For many young people of my generation, or when my generation was young, um, that was a formative political experience. After the lecture, you are cordially invited to the reception in our common room next building, Fabianinka to 24, third floor. Unfortunately, we are not able to serve you neither club cola nor rotkäppchen, sparkling wine, nor any other legendary GDR drinks that used to be my favorites, such as raspberry, raspberry browser or sweet strawberry milk in a brown bottle. But we can nevertheless continue discussing our memories and memory politics there with a class of, glass of Vesi wine. Professor Andrews and her today's topic will be introduced by our Kone fellow Eneken Lanes, senior researcher at the Under and Tuglas Literature Center and associate professor of comparative literature at Tallinn University. Please. Good afternoon. It's my immense pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Molly Andrews, um, the Jane and Atos visiting uh, professor in studies on contemporary society at uh, Helsinki Collegium. 
Uh, Molly um, Andrews is professor of political psychology at the University of East London, where she also um, directs the Center of Narrative Research. Andrews' uh, wide-ranging work focuses on the intersection of autobiographical narratives and the society, the way how um, how people perceive their role in, in the political world, but also the way in which this political world makes some life stories more tellable than others. Uh, and throughout her career, she has conducted um, uh, various major um, life history projects. Um, so she has studied the life stories of lifetime socialists in the UK, the anti-war um, activists uh, in the US, um, also the memories of Die Wende uh, in former East Germany. Uh, and also uh, the testimonies given before the Truth and uh, Recon Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. Molly Andrews has published three monographs. Uh, the first one, Lifetimes of Commitment, Aging, Politics, Psychology, uh, published by Cambridge University Press from um, uh, 1991 and reissued in 2013. Uh, deals with the links between um, lifelong political commitment, uh, social identity, and aging. Her second monograph, Shaping History, Narratives of Political Change, again from the University of, um, uh, from Cambridge University Press from 2007, uh, focuses on the relationship between um, history and uh, uh, biography and features some of them some of the um, case studies from, from these um, projects I, I mentioned in the UK, in the US, um, in Germany and um, in South Africa. This book uh, won the Outstanding Book of the Year Award um, by the American Education uh, Research, uh, Research Association. Her latest book, um, Narrative Imagination and Everyday Life, uh, from Oxford University Press from 2014, deals with the um, role of storytelling uh, and imagination in, um, in aging education and um, politics. She has also edited numerous collective volumes, but I will um, mention just one here, um, one of these, uh, um, which is titled Considering Counter-Narratives, Narrative and Resistance from John Benjamin uh, from 2014. Uh, which she co-edited with Michael Bamberg, and this um, uh, collection, which was based on a, a, a special issue in the journal Narrative Inquiry, has been influential in, uh, or even groundbreaking in, um, in theorizing the concept of counter-narratives in, in narrative studies. Uh, Molly Andrews also serves on the editorial board of five journals and her work has been translated into Chinese, uh, German, Swedish, Spanish and Czech. And last but, last but not least, and I really want to mention with this as a scholar of life uh, stories, she is a very empathetic listener to her colleagues um, and has been immensely supportive uh, to many of us at the Collegium uh, already in these past month and a half. Um, her, her talk today will deal with the promise and limits of political forgiveness and the East German memories of the revolution. So please join me um, in warmly welcoming Jane and um, Artos Eco Professor Molly Andrews. And great. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I would just like to say a very warm thank you um, to a few people, but first of all, to this wonderful audience. I've only been here for six weeks, and I'm already looking out, and I'm seeing what I'm thinking maybe are friends. And um, um, it's quite a strange thing to arrive in a country where you don't really know anyone and you don't have any family, and you don't know the language. And within such a short period of time, people really have reached out a hand in all sorts of ways. And I, I, I want it really to say thank you, first of all, um, for being so welcoming. Um, but there are a few other thank yous as well, and then I will get on. The first one, of course, in a more formal sense, is to the Collegium. And many of us here are part of the Collegium. And it's really quite an extraordinary experience to be part of that collegium because 
It is genuinely supportive of scholarly work, of interdisciplinary work. We together try to think how we can build those conversations across very different disciplines. Sadly, I have to say in my experience, this is becoming less and less common. And so to be in a place where that's so encouraged is really quite a refreshing experience. So. Um, I also would like to thank, obviously, the ERCO Foundation, which makes my um, stay here possible. Um, and I would also really like to acknowledge, um, Thomas already said that, that the ERCO professorships have had a long list of distinguished scholars. Indeed, that's true, and it's a little bit intimidating. Um, and I would say that today I've had messages both from Jane Cowan and from Anne Phoenix with wishing me good luck. And I have to say they have set that bar so high and I do need good luck. So um, yes, indeed. Um, and finally, I, I just need to give a little special call out to my father, Peter Andrews, who's 94. And because of this incredible modern technology we have, I think that if things are going as he was hoping they would, he might be there with a group of his friends sipping coffee and having pastries and watching this. So if that's the case, um, that's rather special. Um, okay. <laughs> so now let us turn to the um, difficult topic at hand, the promise and limits of political forgiveness. I'm going to... Um, start with a wonderful and provocative quote by Derrida, who says, in principle, there's no limit to forgiveness, no to what point, provided, of course, that we agree on some proper meaning of this word. Now, what do we call forgiveness? What calls for forgiveness? Who calls for, who calls upon forgiveness? And I think that this question of what is a proper meaning of forgiveness is exactly what we're going to be grappling with today. Um, for a very long time, perhaps for all of human history, um, many people have made a strong case for advocating for the importance of forgiveness um, from Aristotle, Plato, Christ, many, many people, okay? Um, I'm gonna jump quite a way and moved to Hannah Arendt, who actually made the case that forgiveness is one of the human faculties that make social change possible. Um, that in fact, and as we're going to look, it's one of the few things that actually has the potential to move us from, from the past to a different kind of future. Well, f forgiveness might be all of that, but it's still clear to me that we don't really know exactly what we mean. We don't necessarily share a sense of what we're talking about when we talk about forgiveness. Barbara Mitzel has um, said that there is a major political, that forgiveness is a major political topic. And indeed, she's even asked, is forgiveness a new political fashion? Um, I was walking down the street the other day, actually, and of course this, this lecture was running in my head, and I thought, am I actually just seeing things? Because this is by the Helsinki rail station, you might have seen this, this huge sign that says, forgive, and I'm like, okay. So I, I was first a little hesitant to even include it in this talk. I thought it must have some reference in it that I wasn't understanding, and I went up there, it was sort of a bit like a mystery, and I tried to find, was there a, group, an organization, or that it referred to, or a box where you were supposed to give something? No, it was the, the if you see it yourselves, it, the word just stands on its own. What does it mean? Okay, I think that the questions around the meaning of forgiveness are very narrative, if you don't mind me saying so. There's a lack of clarity around the questions of who, what, where, when, why, and indeed how to forgive. And this paper is going to actually look at each of these narrative components in turn. The data that I'm going to be pulling from 
uh, primarily comes from an East German project that I started in 1992. And because of my good fortune of being with the Collegium, I will be continuing, actually, in about 10 days when I carry on some more interviews there. Um, in 1992, I interviewed about uh, 40 anti-state activists, um, people who were very much part of the East German underground movement, um, and in many ways were um, identified as being responsible for having brought down the wall. That wasn't actually a way that they thought of themselves, but they were certainly very, very important key actors in the bloodless revolution of 1989. Um, and when I arrived in 1992, it was um, because I didn't have a proper grant for that work, I sort of made a patchwork quilting of, of support. Um, I arrived just a few weeks after the opening of the Stasi files. And I had never gone there thinking I was going to do any research on forgiveness, but you can imagine that with that conversation burst wide open, that in fact questions of forgiveness seeped into virtually every conversation I had. Um, in 2012, I then had the good fortune. I was supported by the Wissenschaftszentrum in Berlin, and they supported me to re-interview 15 of the original 40 um, participants. And, um, and as well as that research, uh, I also commissioned some portraits um, from this wonderful British photographer, Vaughn Metzler. Throughout my talk, you're going to see photographs which she um, took in 2012, and these are juxtaposed with photographs. I've written on the earlier photographs, 1992. That's more or less 1992. I'm just trying to show you visually um, what these people looked like over the time I've been speaking with them. Um, so I can, I really want to just say before launching into this um, narrative exploration that this conversation of forgiveness uh, was seen as being very important by all of the participants I spoke with. And here is a quote by Wolfgang Templin. Templin was identified by Eric Honecker as, quote, the number one enemy of the state. Um, and his Stasi file was, I think, longer than virtually anyone else, certainly that I met, but it was notoriously huge Stasi file. And Templin um, says to me in, in 2012, he says, well, forgiveness is still one of the most important questions in the larger and the smaller sense. And it's this two-layered um, approach that I'm going to be adopting here, the larger, the societal, the political context, as well as the smaller, the more personal, the, the more intimate, this relationship between the micro and the macro. So, and uh, sorry, and just to say here, as you see, so here are the two pictures of him, the 2012 photograph, um, the ones, the portraits which were taken by Vaughn Metzler, these were taken in places which were chosen by the participants themselves. Um, and uh, some of the 1992 photographs, not this one in particular, but if you see a black circle around it, for instance, that means that it was a photograph that was taken by the Stasi, okay? Um, because part of this project was also spending a lot of time in archives and looking through these old photographs and it was quite a strange experience looking at the photographs which were in fact the gaze of the Stasi into the lives of these people. I have many, many Stasi photographs of Templin standing on the corner, having a cigarette, playing music with his friends or whatever. It's very strange. Okay, so how did the um, topic of forgiveness first present itself? Quite surprisingly, I have to say. So, in one of my early interviews in, in 1992, I was um, speaking with a woman called Katia Havman. And Havman was a very, um, she, she was a very brave political activist in her own right. She was part of the group Women for Peace. Um, 
and she was a, an activist herself, but she was also, and perhaps more notoriously, also the wife of Robert Hoffman. Robert Hoffman was the symbol of East German resistance. I sometimes say he was sort of like the Martin Luther King of the movement towards for, for more democratic socialism in East Germany. And for the last two years of Robert Hoffman's life, um, he lived, they lived under house arrest in their home in Grunheide outside of Berlin. And, and then he died. And so I had this good fortune to have an interview with Katja Hoffman. And I asked her, I think quite naively now as I look at it, I say, well, could, could you forgive the Stasi for what they did? Because effectively they robbed her of the last two years of her life with her husband, being able to go on walks. And they were, you know, they, they, they were confined to the space of their home. So could you forgive them? And this is what she responded to me. She said, no, it actually works in quite a different way to that. They still can't forgive us for what they did to us. We are the living guilty conscience. We are still alive. We experienced it all. We are also still witnesses. We were naive in extending too quickly our forgiveness. We had hoped that they would readily say we were really wrong about this one. We imagined they would also feel relieved when they finally were able to come out of this role. I was stunned when I heard this. I, I was so surprised. And, um, and it was one of those few moments when you really feel like you've heard something very different that is very much against what you're expecting in here. I can tell you that I spent the next few years thinking about this question and indeed researching this question. Um, in terms of the narrative analysis of the forgiveness, this, this immediately shows us the question of the who, who should forgive whom, is very tricky. Okay? There is this idea of the quote, offended offender. Okay? She says, it's they who cannot forgive us for what they have done to us. We are desperate to forgive them. They do not want to enter into that conversation. You're going to see a repetition of this theme as we move on. But let's now move to the second question. If we don't know who to forgive, well, do we know what should be forgiven? That's also a difficult one, especially in the context of a dictatorship. Um, here I use the work of Deisiger who talks about the complexity of forgiveness in authoritarian regimes. I'm just going to read this quote. He says, the scope of this moral spillover can vary widely depending on the nature of the wrong and the knowledge and freedom of the citizenry. In oppressive regimes, the number of collaborators may be quite large, even though the avenues for action are narrowed considerably. The question of politically forgiving citizens who collaborated with an unjust res regime can arise only after the government has been replaced with a just set of arrangements. Well, this shows you that, in fact, um, it's a very tricky question. What happens if somebody is actually doing something that is, in fact, legal, that is in fact not only legal, but encouraged and sponsored by the state. In the um, situation of East Germany, the question of who is a perpetrator and who is a victim is very, very difficult to ascertain. You might say, okay, official employees of the Stasi, perhaps, um, well, that's 91,000 people, okay, and they actually, after all, are working for the state. or the Stasi informers, the informal informers, 174,000 people. Or how far down do you want to go? You might want to include the 1,052, quote, surveillance specialists whose full-time job was to listen to taped phone calls. Or how about the 2,100 people who spent all of their time steaming open letters? Or the 5,000 people who followed suspects? How far are we willing to go to say that people are perpetrators? As Ruth Reinecke, who um, 
was, she still is actually, an actress uh, at the Maxim Gorky Theater, says to me in 1992, she says, yes, of course, you, you, we have to be able to forgive, but what? It's not, that, that's not at all clear. And in, in an, another conversation with a, one of the participants, Annette Simon, she says to me, well, my question is, can I forgive the country? Okay, and yet, is that the way forgiveness works between an individual and a country? The problem is summarized here by Wolfgang Thierse. He says, well, in the, in the case of the GDR, he says there are real perpetrators and real victims, guilty ones and innocent ones, and then in between the many others, we who live there, busy getting by more or less decent, more or less clever, more or less cowardly or brave. And I think if we had to actually come under the moral microscope in our own society, probably most of us would be in that last bit too. Those of us who more or less lead our lives. Um, so it's really not clear not only who is to be forgiven, but indeed what. What are the actions? Let's move then um, to the question of how. Um, the account I'm going to give you now comes from Conrad Weiss, a documentary filmmaker. And I, he, he tells me about a situation where he's unable to forgive someone who has spied on him. This is in the interview I have with him in 2012. And he tells me about this person and he says, no, I cannot forgive him because he was, quote, defending his actions till this day. That's the real problem. I, I need to actually backtrack just for a moment here and tell you that part of my methodology was that I would actually send people the recordings of our interviews from 20 years earlier, as well as the transcripts. And in preparation for our interviews 20 years later, they would have read them, okay? So both he and I had just read and listened to a conversation between the two of us 20 years earlier. So what I say here in response to his inability to forgive this person, I say, well, I have the words of a very wise man here. I want to share this with you. It says, and I turn to him and I say, this is you, it, this says, Forgiveness presupposes the confession of guilt. An insight, do you remember this? Because those are the very words he had told me in 1992. But he was saying those words from, I want to say, a more hopeful position. But now, 20 years later, he's talking about someone who had really infiltrated his life and was still unable to apologize. So I say, I quote this, forgiveness presupposes the confession of guilt. And Weiss says to me, that's what makes it so difficult. I remember these thoughts well, and they are important. But the problem was that the overwhelming majority of those concerned did not take that step. I mean, those who worked for the Stasi, to acknowledge what they did only under pressure, but never to come out with the whole thing on their own, to speak about it, to stand up for it, and to show that they had thought about it. To put it in general, somewhat rough terms, the persecutors expect their victims to forgive them without any apology. That's not possible. That's the principal conflict in many of these cases. So for him, the critical question is that there needs to be both an acknowledgement and an accountability, okay? Again, as we've seen in earlier examples, he is very keen to forgive, but these are prerequisites for that. For me, the most outstanding work that has been done in the area of political forgiveness continues to be Donald Shriver's book, published now 25 years ago, An Ethic for Enemies, Forgiveness in Politics. And Shriver's very powerful book identifies four constituent components of the meaning of forgiveness. The first is that 
both parties have to agree that a wrong has been committed. That means that memory is suffused with moral judgment. Okay, both people remember it, both think people think it was wrong. Secondly, forgiveness requires forbearance from revenge. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, third, there must be empathy, and he makes this very clearly distinct from sympathy. There must be empathy for the enemy's humanity. For those of you who will recognize the language of Ubuntu from South Africa, this idea of recognizing the humanness in everyone. And fourthly, Shriver says that forgiveness aims at the renewal of a human relationship. But it is a renewal that is very much infused with memory, okay? Not amnesia, critically. So building on this work, and after following my conversation with Katia Havman in the early 90s, I spent a lot of years doing work on political forgiveness. And I basically published a um, framework which basically said that forgiveness requires, it, forgiveness is a relational uh, encounter. Unlike some other work on forgiveness, which says that it can be unilateral, in this model, in Shriver's and indeed in my own, it requires two people, two parties, it, the wronged and the wrongdoer and it's a dialectic relationship. And it requires a confession, ownership, and some kind of an expression of remorse. Now, <clears throat> this is still under this sort of general uh, umbrella of how does forgiveness happen. So it is this relational thing. One of the things that happen in um, East Germany was that there was often a lot of acknowledgement about what happened, okay, but there was not really uh, an expression of remorse. Because of the situation, because the existence of, of the dictatorship, many people argued you can actually see how this happened, right? And instead they sort of offered up a explanation, a justification but not really an apology. Now, the relationship, I'm not going, especially with so many philosophers in the room, I daren't really go into um, uh, much here about the difference between apology and apologia, except that to say that the words are very, very different and have a very important, different history. Apologia, as we know, dates back at least, I'm looking to Hannah here, you're gonna to have to correct me here, but it dates back at least we know to Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and um, the idea that there is somehow a speaking in defense of a position. It's not until the late 16th century, I believe it was 1590 that the word apology first appeared um, to indicate a, an expression of regret. And you can imagine that if you are looking for an expression of regret and instead you receive a justification or a explanation, these are very, very different offerings and they are received very, very differently. And we are going to look now at the example of um, some of the tensions between this. So the next person that I'm gonna tell you about is Irena Kukuts. Um, she was um, she was again one of the Women for Peace, one of the founding members of, her, of Women for Peace. She later, um, when I interviewed her in 2012, she said that she was con continuing her political work hard and strong because at this point she was an archivist for the Robert Hoffman Gesellschaft, the archives, and she made the argument, and I think a very convincing one, that archive work can be very, very political work. And um, so she says to me, well, there were only just a very few people that said, well, yes, I made mistakes, who would confess so that on the other hand, the others were affected by their actions could have said, 
I forgive you. You can see again this, this desire to have this communication. It was more that some of them actually wanted something like an absolution. Like, well, now I've told you everything, now everything's good, and now we can move on to the daily routine. So there was no consciousness about injustice. There, I can become quite furious. <clears throat> Hold on. But there was not, not everyone actually did feel, although many people did feel this way, um, that wasn't true across the board. And now I'm going to tell you of the most marked exception to this. And this is Ruth Misselwitz, who was a pastor, is a pastor with the Nikolai Kirche. And she was the one who had perhaps the most harrowing encounter with the Stasi, an ongoing. I'm not really going to go into details with that here, but it's pretty horrific. And, um, and what she decided to do um, after, oh, oh well, um, what she decided to do after she saw her files and everything and realized how lucky she was to be alive was she decided to invite the actual agent into her home and to meet him. She said, I did once have a meeting with a Stasi officer who had been responsible for me and my husband and the peace circle at Penko. When she says responsible for me, that's an extraordinary euphemism. And she says, during the GDR era, he was responsible for many inconveniences. The language here is in amazing. I had several people, because these interviews were done in German, I had several people actually check the language. And this was pretty much where it landed. Impediments, attacks on us. And I had a conversation with him. The man confessed everything I asked him about. He said, yes, I was accountable for this, but he didn't apologize. In that sense, there was no sense of having committed acts of injustice. But for me, it was a very liberating experience because I finally saw a face. I didn't need an apology from him. It was enough that he came. That was a very, very difficult step for him. Now, there, the excerpt which I use in the um, published form of this paper is much more extensive because she actually says why the word forgiveness, apology, repentance, why she doesn't need those words. All she needs is a face, okay? For her, this who was really the most important thing. And she was an extraordinarily moving woman, I have to say, because listening to her, she tells about this man being in her living room. I have to say that her husband was so appalled by the idea that this man would be in their home. He couldn't actually stay in there with her. So in fact, she invited a close friend so that she wouldn't be alone with him. So she had this guy in her house. And she said, there he was telling me about his sad life. He had no friends. He had no family. She said, but I had such a rich life. I have such a rich life. I have friends. I have family. I realized his was a sad life. Mine was not, and I didn't need him to say, I'm sorry, okay? And this was really quite an amazing thing to hear because other people really did feel that there needed to be an explicit expression of remorse, but not for her. Okay, so this, that is the, the how. Well, let's move on then to when. <clears throat> I use here uh, the work of Charles Griswold, who um, has written a, a really quite powerful philosophical examination of the concept of forgiveness. He says, the idea of narrative helps to explain just how the past can nonetheless change without pretense to undoing it. So acknowledging it, right, but, and not trying to undo it, but actually reinterpreting it. 
without pre pretense to undoing it or ignoring, avoiding, rationalizing, or forgetting it. One may adopt a different perspective on it, attach a different meaning to it, respond to it in a different way, adapt it to one's evolving life story. Now, I think this resonates very much also with the opening quote by Hannah Arendt, that it is forgiveness which allows us uh, to actually think about moving from the past into visualizing a different kind of social change. Um, Arendt has actually uh, said that forgiveness provides us with a solution to the predicament of irreversibility. You can't undo the past, but you can actually rethink it, and you can re- visit that in light of what you know in the present and thereby allow yourself to be able to visualize different futures. Um, and this is the argument that Griswold and others make, that narratives are, of forgiveness are both projective, i.e. allowing us to think of a different future, but they're also essentially recollective as well. They are based on, a, on memory, of course. Um, so that this is a process of reinterpreting the past which creates a possibility for a future renewal. So the role of narrative imagination plays a central, if not a, a defining role, in the process of forgiveness. The past is reframed to include the story of the offender, and this pursuit is influenced by a reimagining of the future including questions about the ideal life. And here, I also include, importantly, what is the life that one will want to look back on? After a traumatic rupture, does one want to feel, and my life ended there, or that somehow, fully acknowledging all that has happened, I nonetheless was able to re-envision a way of going forward, which did not entail me pretending that the past did not happen. So this, in this way, we can see that narratives of forgiveness, that this dialogic conversation is really critical. But if narratives of forgiveness create a opportunity for the future, how long is that window open for? And now we're gonna to turn to the question of time. As you know, narratives are critical to any consideration about time. Temporality and time are integrally tied together. Narratives are constructed in, through, and often around time. But narratives change. They're not constant. Their meaning is dynamic. And there are windows of opportunity for narratives. That means sometimes things are more and less tellable. Sometimes things are not speakable. There are windows for opportunity which exist for narratives, and sometimes those windows close, just as sometimes they open. And articulations, which were once not only possible, but also very much desired, might become no longer so. So, how long do you have to say you're sorry? I'm going to turn back now to Irena Kukuts, who I introduced you to earlier, the ceramicist and the archivist. And she told quite a powerful story. Uh, in her small group, the Women for Peace, after the Stasi files had opened, they learned that one amongst them had been an informant. Now, any of you who have engaged in political work, much less clandestine political work, will know what that will, can imagine, at least what that would feel like, to have somebody who you think is your most trusted person to find out that after your political meetings, they would go back and report on you to the state. This is what happened in this sisterhood, because they were just women. And so, two of the women, Katya Havman, who I introduced you to in the first quote, and, and Irena Kukuts, both, both very close friends and both part of this Women for Peace, decided that they would interview Monica, Moni, uh, to try to make sense of how she had done what she had done. They, 
they had a series of interviews with her. They published a book about this. It was really one of the most, uh, I want to say, brave and committed projects to narrative, interpersonal narratives, as well as political, that I've ever heard of. I was, as you can imagine, very well fascinated by this. This book made a big hit in Germany, okay? And after the book was published, this event happened. So Irena is telling me this. She says, there came a letter for Monica, Moni, where a woman was saying thank you for her bravery and the great accomplishment to write that book. Yes. And because Monica is dead, I opened it, and I answered her back, because in this letter, she explained that she has kind of the same history, but that she hasn't spoken with her girl girlfriends about that. And I became so angry about that. And first of all, I told her that we wrote that book, Katya and me. So I wrote her a really bad letter. And in this letter, I told her that now she doesn't have to tell her friends anymore. Everything has its time, and she should wander around with her story. She was really hurt, and full of anger, she answered. So I say to myself now, well, they should keep their stories to themselves. So I, re I say, hmm, 20 years of silence. And she says, yes, so late. And then they want to get acknowledgement. And there are others which then come and say, Sudden, suddenly in the past you did what? Like the Stasi stories are always present. People that want to become clean now after all that time, yeah, well, it's too late then. So you can see she had quite strong feelings about that. Um, not everyone did feel that way. There was quite a wide um, range of difference of how people felt. I'm going to read to you a very different response. Um, this woman is Ulrika Pope. Ulrika Pope is now, she is still a very, very well-known person uh, in Berlin. Uh, she was, in fact, in her youth, she was one of the founding members of uh, Democracy Now!, but she later became the Brandenburg Commissioner for the Consequences of the Communist Dictatorship. And, in fact, she, um, one of her key jobs was actually trying to help find ways to reintegrate former Stasi people into um, the community. So, this interview is literally the next day. It's the day after my arena cuckoos, and I'm still catching my breath from that one. So I ask her, well, what do you think about this? Is there ever a moment when it all becomes too late for perpetrators to come forward? And she says, well, no, I don't think there's a moment when it's too late. I believe, on the contrary, that that takes time. Some people don't speak about weights which are heavily on their soul until very late. That's true for perpetrators as for victims. My father will be 90 next year. I visited him yesterday, both of my parents. Throughout my entire childhood and afterwards, he never spoke about the war, and we never asked. He was a soldier on the Eastern Front, a medic. He experienced terrible, gruesome dying all around. Yesterday, when I visited him, he started to talk. All of these stories he lived through in the Baltic states, and then my mother started to tell of her flight from the Russians all the way to the Elbe River. That's coming only now. In my circle of friends and acquaintances, their parents don't tell their stories until the very end of their lives. That's why I believe that this has its own time. What's interesting is that this is not really a story about forgiveness, and it's not really ostensibly about um, perpetrators and victims. That's not the story she's telling. She's telling, a, uh, she, she's framing it about a story of tellability, that some things have their time in which they can be told. And, but she certainly does not hold the same opinion as Irena Kukuts. There's a third and rather chilling position, uh, which another respondent uh, said, and that is, again, coming back to Conrad Weiss. He says, well, I believe that in the end, time passed the people by. 
It's no longer important. There's no point in arguing with old men of 80 about their activities in the Stasi. They won't change, they won't see their wrong, but they can't do any more harm either. In a sense, what he's saying is that their burden is that they have become irrelevant. In, in effect, he, he and he thinks others have basically written them off. So <clears throat> let's move then to the where. Um, Smith in 2008 has argued that that what it means to give and receive an apology is very much depends on the context. And I think that this is true. And one of the things that I'm going to just look at very quickly here is the juxtaposition between the private and the public spheres. So far, you have been invited into the living room of Ruth Misselwitz, who sits there with this Stasi person who had really threatened her life and her family's life, but that's in her living room. So what about truth commissions? Well, in fact, East Germany had a very, uh, had a truth commission that not very many people knew about, okay? Um, not even many East Germans. The, that truth commission was set up essentially as a way of winding up the 40-year history of the GDR. Unlike, in fact, in, in complete juxtaposition to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa, which was effectively um, trying to launch the rebirth of a country, this NCAT commission was, was of a very, very different kind. As you can see, it was 148 reports commissioned on 95 questions. There were 759 papers academic papers which came together in a 15 volume compilation. And actually here's a real point of contrast with South Africa which had 22,000 witnesses. In, South in um, East Germany there were 327 individuals who gave their testimony. There were no perpetrators and indeed all of those who were chosen to give testimony were examples of what were considered, quote, the unsung victims of communist rule, okay? So it, they were trying to document the idea that different kinds of lives were possible under East Germany, and, and here we have evidence of them, okay? So this, un unlike South Africa, where, as you might know, the TRC re recordings would be uh, not only aired in public in huge uh, areas in the city and in, in public spaces in cities, and there were um, soap operas that incorporated facts from the from the TRC. This was just the opposite. This was a very very. Uh, academic project which few people knew about and even fewer were invited to participate in. As Jeffrey Hawthorne says, in Germany the offending regime is no longer in power. The new regime has instigated a process of settling accounts with a discontinuous past. Well, in other words, you're not, you're, the, the purpose of the Truth Commission was very, very important for what was allowed to be said there. As I write here, if forgiveness and national healing were the watchwords of the South African TRC, the reverse can be said of the Enquete Commission, which firmly established moral storylines with villains and heroes of a nation whose purpose it was to document and effectively bury. Thus, the intended audience of the East German Commission was the Bundestag, and certainly not East Germany or East Germans. Annette Simon, who was a well-known psychoanalyst, also um, the daughter of the well-known East German author, Christa Wolf, um, has actually pointed to the um, importance of the private sphere being a place where people can actually tell about things where they participated in wrongdoing, as it were. And she says to me here, by the way, I, I put that date wrong. This is a, a quote from 1992. 
Um, she said, in the rapid unification process, it wasn't possible for each side to sort out their affairs in peace and quiet. If this were only the business of the GDR, it would be easier. In other words, having this truth commission and having these victim-victimizer talks in these iconic places like Checkpoint Charlie, and these were televised, these kind of public encounters were big, um, it's kind of, when they were public like this, they were, they were well televised. She said, it's an, East, it's an East German affair. And then you could sort out things in your own family, if you will. But this way, you have to do it with the other family that can't stand you anyway. That's the hard part. So this question about where and how to have these conversations, which might ultimately lead to forgiveness, it's a very vexed question. Shireen Rai has written about the risks of citizenship, and I think she argues very convincingly that, in fact, rather than juxtaposing the private and the public spheres, we should more helpfully regard these as coexisting with one another. And I think if you think about the East German context and you think about um, whatever, Ruth Misselwitz's uh, living room, um, and these other more public forms, you see that these things are happening at the same time. Rai says it's extremely important to think, well, who is the audience for this performance? And to recognize that public encounters, these, these uh, tater opfer, victim victimizer talks, for instance, that were happening at these iconic places like Checkpoint Charlie, these are sort of more public spectacle. There's a very particular script which people expect to be followed. But maybe they have their own role as well. But equally, private encounters, such as that of Misselwitz, um, have their limitations as well. Surely they lack that uh, stamp of public acknowledgement, which truth commissions, for instance, are established to set up. So this is part of the problem. Well, turning then to our last question, well, why, why should we promote forgiveness? There are a lot of assumptions, and I started with some of them to begin. There are assumptions that, that forgiveness is something that we should really work towards, that it's a good thing. Well, there are several assumptions about this. One is that forgiveness potentially releases us, it releases an injured and an offended party from a traumatic past. It gives you the possibility for a different kind of future. There's a, a not very well examined um, assumption that what works well for the individual works well for the community and the other way around. In fact, many people who have given testimony in public spaces like truth commissions have said that they did so despite the personal pain that this caused them, despite the fact that this is like ripping off scabs that have only just begun to heal. Nonetheless, there has been a kind of slippage between a lot of the talk on forgiveness, that it's good for the individuals to forgive, and it's good for the community. And it avoids bloodshed. And then if you were to look at the more recent work in forgiveness, there's a whole new forgiveness science, okay? Which I must say, this work here um, is not part of that literature. But they actually argue for the health benefits of forgiveness. You feel good when you do it, okay? So I want to look in depth at a different answer to all these, um, and that is provided by Werner Fischer. Werner Fischer, um, he is, was one of the more well-known uh, East German dissidents you always hear about people not being allowed to leave East Germany, but he was in fact forcibly exiled. Um, he and Berbo Bolai were forced to go to England, actually, and um, they lived there for six months where he said they had the horror of witnessing capitalism in all its full-blown glory. 
um, and they would do things like they were they he was act, they were actually depressed, right? And he said we would just pass our days, and then, you know, I would say, okay, let's just go to Herod's and look at Herod's, you know. And he told some quite extraordinary stories about that time. Anyway, um, but he then finds himself in a strange series of events where he is, in fact, the person who is responsible for the for dissolving the Stasi. And his office is actually in the old Stasi building. Okay, and he says, "I had a bodyguard." All, and this is, sorry, this is in 1992, he's talking. He says, I had a bodyguard, all former MFS Stasi, all former MFS people, and a secretary, also former MFS, and there I was sitting at this desk and was thinking to myself, where were you two years ago? Then I was in this room being interrogated, and I visited the cell I was held in, and somehow I couldn't comprehend all that had happened. I was much more tolerant then because I took the view that if we managed to create an atmosphere in which people relax and admit that they were spies, then, well, it need not be made public. It's sufficient if everyone is confronted with his counterpart and they have a, ch a chat face to face, then we have the situation where one can say, well, okay, maybe under similar circumstances, I would have acted the same. Unfortunately, what I had expected from people did not happen, that they come clean about their actions. Of course, they can only do so if they are without fear. And the atmosphere was, and still is today, not very conducive for that to happen. Many people hope that their collaboration with the system will never be discovered. I think that this is tragic, not only for their personal future, development, but for the inner peace of the country. In human terms, I find this reprehensible. One of the really difficult things about reading that quote out loud is that I only recently learned that Fisher himself, two years ago, found out that his mother had in fact been reporting on his activities for many years of his life. He, and what was extraordinary to me, given that he was in such a high position with the dis dissolution of the Stasi, how did that take, what, 26 years to come out? Um, I don't know if I will be able to speak with him or not when we return to Berlin in early November, and I find it quite painful to imagine what he might say about that. Well. Moving to conclude then, this question about, well, why forgiveness? Why do we push for it? Nietzsche famously advocated abandoning the idea of forgiveness, regarding it as a sign of weakness. And I hope that you will have seen in the talk I've given today that on the contrary, forgiveness demands very hard work for those who are prepared to struggle for an alternative vision of the future. But here, when I talk about forgiveness, I'm talking about a forgiveness which includes acknowledgement and accountability of what has happened. Without those, a forgiveness that actually turns its back on acknowledgement and accountability would, in the words of John Dewey, be an instance of, quote, presumed good serving as a cloak for actual bad. I want to turn now again to Derrida, who says, forgiveness is not, it should not be normal, normative, normalizing. It should remain exceptional and extraordinary in the face of the impossible, as it has interrupted the ordinary course of historical temporality. In conclusion, I would like to say that the fraught process of forgiveness embodies not consensus, but contest, a battle over the past, in the present, and for the future. 
Although difficult, maybe even rare in its full realization, forgiveness represents one of our most human capabilities, that of transformation of self and society through communication, accountability, and understanding. The hard work of forgiveness upholds the principles of the moral universe, even while they are contested, and links hope to change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this talk, a wonderful. Ah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, wonderful talk overall, and so many fantastic um, glimpses into the past and present and future. Um, the one question I have is maybe a bigger one that goes also back to your earlier work, and um, I'm wondering about why forgiveness needs to be always a relationship, and why it can't be more an act. Because one might imagine that, um, and I'm wondering if this came up in your narratives, did any of the people speak of the possibility of forgiving? Because as you point out, sometimes it may be impossible to know whom to forgive because it's very unclear who are the perpetrators. And whether there might be something there in terms of forgiving a situation which no longer exists, which cannot be personified in any individuals, but rather is directed toward a power relationship which was abusive and a regime which is now gone, whether you see any such possibility. Um, I, would, I would say, th thank you, Mia. Um, I would say uh, that the people I spoke with would argue that there are a cluster of words which are often put together and that they should be disentangled. And that there are many reasons and ways to want to move beyond the past. But that the question of forgiveness, you really do need to know who has done what. And I have to say that the work that I'm talking about here um, is really in juxtaposition the, the, to the major work in psychology. There's not been a lot of work in psychology on forgiveness. It's kind of strange, given that it's like you would think a bread and butter concept, right? But in fact, especially when I began this work in the 90s, there was virtually nothing. But the most dominant model of forgiveness actually advocates the possibility of a unilateral forgiveness, that the highest stage of, of a moral stance is that forgiveness which simply says, I forgive you. I forgive you, Lord, they know not what they are doing, okay? Now, I know that for some people that's a very important framework, but the people that I spoke with actually felt that that's also a very irresponsible framework. That people, that if you actually do that, yeah, you might feel better. You might think, okay, that helps me to move on. But actually, for the, if you, for lack of a better term, for the purposes of the moral universe, it's not good enough, okay? And that people need to be accountable. And so there are other things you can do. This is, this is also, as you probably know, one of the, um, big critiques about what happened in South Africa, the, the project of truth and reconciliation, they're like, you know, these things sit in real tension with each other, and much less forgiveness. I can talk a long time about the forgiveness in, in, in that model as well, um, but the idea that these things all run in the same way, in the same direction, they don't. They hit against each other all the time. And we need to ask ourselves, why is it that we think it's so important that you forgive someone? Uh, why is it that we're put... In, in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I'll just say this one thing. Um, there was a clear push for the language of forgiveness. Um, there was a... 13% in, in of the 22,000 people who gave testimony spoke about forgiveness. There was a study done following up with those 13% of people, and they went back to them and said, okay, so you spoke about forgiveness here. What did you mean? Most of those people who said that said, you know what? 
when, the more I thought about it, I don't actually forgive. It was like a language, a discourse that was very much supported and upheld by the particular project which was a very important one, which was to avoid bloodshed in South Africa, okay? That was what that was set up to do and that is effectively what it did do. But to ask for forgiveness on top of reconciliation was a step too far for many people, so. It's my turn, Molly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, uh, I wonder if you can comment on the fact that your interviewees are all political, intellectual elites uh, who are extremely articulate, who have obviously thought about these issues, and whether you would get um, a different picture of forgiveness if you were to hang out with people who were damaged, you know, industrial workers, for example, who might have been really damaged by, by the Stasi, and may, so I'm, I'm sort of introducing a sort of yeah. plus dimension here. Yeah. Where, um, yeah, yeah, but what I would like to say is, um, and I should have probably said more about who those people were, um, they were absolutely not an intellectual elite. My, my, my original study, as I had wanted to do it in 1990, was to be with the original 30 members who were the founding members of Noise Form, the political group which was founded at Katia Hoffman's house and which you know immediately led to this, you know, this uh, protest thing that 400,000 people signed, et cetera, et cetera. The interesting thing about those 30 people is they were, in fact, construction workers, uh, artists, pastors, um, I, th I can think of one actual academic amongst them, Jens Reich, he was the only one who spoke English actually. Um, uh, there, it, there was a real mixture in people. Now, to say that they were political elites, the word elite, I'm not so sure about. To say that they were highly political people, absolutely. That's, that's how I identified them, that's who I was going to interview. But this question of, of class is not, it, it, especially in the East German context. I mean, these, these were not elites by, by any means. And in terms of people who had, I don't know that they would use the language of damage, but whose lives were severely impacted by the Stasi. This was them, okay? They're not talking about, they're not hanging on, I mean, I, I sort of try not to sensationalize it too much, but some of the stories that I heard were, were just extraordinary. I mean, they, they, they were, um, so these are people who, I want to say, know what they're talking about uh, in terms of the experiences that they're trying to get beyond. Okay, uh, Molly, that was terrific. You've given us so much to think about. It's not what I expected. I always thought of forgiveness in that way you were talking about, where to forgive is power. And now I'm seeing there's another dimension to that. I, I'm wondering about uh, the, the circumstances of these uh, truth commissions, comparing South Africa and East Germany. Is it, do I understand correctly? Oh, by the way, I heard you mention the name Krista Wolf. I believe she has confessed to being a Stasi agent. I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, but is it, was it not, not the case that in Germany there was a blanket forgiveness in the form of amnesty? That there was nobody who could be found guilty in, in, in a criminal court for having done whatever they did as an agent of the East German government. You see, you're nodding your head no. Uh, and I know the case of uh, South Africa, one of the things that was most important was sifting out between people who had done some pretty bad things who might be able to be forgiven, and people who are known to have committed crimes against humanity, especially people who order the torture, uh, et cetera, of some of the people. So I'm wondering about the condition of amnesty that goes before these other kinds of commission activities and how that affects what forgiveness may or may not be. If, for example, if, you're, if you confess and there's no consequences, 
That's, 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 that's one thing. If you confess, and there might be consequences, that's another. Uh, um, and, and, and finally, if, if you confess and there's n no consequences legally, what about your standing in your society? Are all these people suddenly ostracized because they came forward? Is there, a, okay. apart from legal amnesty, is there a, another kind of amnesty that's needed for this to work? Mm. Okay, so thanks. There, there, are, there are a bunch of um, different components to that comment, and I don't know if I'll be able to get to all of them. Uh, Crystal Wolf, uh, she, she was not a, a uh, formal, an employee of the Stasi, okay? She, she had been an informal informant in her youth, but as I tried to show you as well, you know, so were many people. There were many, 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 many people who uh, were kind of informally involved, okay? Um, and th that's a whole other conversation. Um, and by the way, Annette Simon is very much her own woman. She is not, she's a very, very different, uh, she, you know, there's a whole question of intergenerational uh, understandings of East German identity, questions of forgiveness, et cetera, which work in pretty complicated ways. So, um, and I did happen to mention Crystal Wolf here, but I often don't because it can sidetrack you. It's a one, it's a one name that a lot of people do know of East Germans, and they uh, sort of interesting to that. Um, but the question of amnesty is interesting. It doesn't really arise in the East German context because you don't have any perpetrators who are giving, in terms of the East German Truth Commission. That's not what they were doing, right? They were getting the likes of the people who you've just met here, met, um, to tell their stories because they wanted to actually document that it was possible to lead a moral life, even though you suffered real consequences. You're, you know, you couldn't go to university, your kids couldn't go to university, you couldn't be promoted at work, you could, whatever. People did manage. Some people somehow managed, okay? So by collecting only these as the stories, none of those in-between kind of stories, it made, as I tried to argue, a kind of black and white morality tale, okay? Such a different kind of scene than what was going on in South Africa, okay? South Africa made, I mean, they made a political strategic decision which was understandable, but morally there were a lot of problems with it, okay? Yes, they did grant amnesty for the perpetrators who came forward, but for a lot of victims, people who I have spoken with, that was highly problematic because what it meant was that people could come and they could tell every detail of what they did, which were some horrific things, and then just say, okay, I told it, right? That's it. So, but how can you actually legislate remorse? It's, you know, King Lear, right? Tell me how sorry you are and then I'll let you off. You can't, that can't be part of the legal requirement. Nonetheless, was that galling for people to sit and to hear testimony from their perpetrators going accurately through what they had done and then to leave? Yeah, that was a problem. But we can understand because people were trying to attract people to come in and to give that testimony. Nonetheless, in South Africa, as in East Germany, East Germany, not in the Truth Commission setting, but um, people only tended to come forward with stuff they thought people already knew, okay? And so there are many reasons for this, okay? You might think that you're not going to get found out, but yeah, of course, there are, there, there, there is damage to be done to your reputation as a moral being once you fess up to this, right? So um, this was one of the real problems. And that's what Werner Fischer, in the last um, extended quotation that I was reading from, that's what he was talking about. He said, look, we don't have to go public on this thing if you don't want. We could have it just you and me, and then I could understand how you did it. We don't have to make you actually you know, rub your nose in the dirt, but we do need you to say what you've done. Okay, and even then people want to do it. Now, because perpetrators were not asked 
to be part of the Truth Commission. It, did, it happened outside of that context. But it is nonetheless true um, that East Germans um, were and continue to be, actually all you have to look is employment rates, you can look at all sorts of statistics that can tell you that indeed, even though we are 30 years post-unification, that in fact, it still carries quite a paintbrush with it, okay? My name is Rene Ebert. Uh, I'm a former Finnish ambassador to Berlin, and I've spent a lot of time in, in, in Germany, and, and, but I've never worked and never lived in, G, in the GDR. I've always watched it from the outside. I remember going in and going out, hmm. and doing hmm. that, uh, knowing that I can get out. Uh, uh, what I was actually missing in your, uh, in your presentation, which, was, uh, which, which I very much liked, is that you made several references to, references to South Africa, but you did not say a word about the other German uh, moral uh, uh, bankruptcy, and that is the Third Reich. Because you, in a way you have a parallel there. I, I, can, I could imagine that you would, in your book, uh, make references to this aspect, but still, that that is the. I mean, you had the allies to care of 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 everything until it was uh, until the allies left it to the Germans, and then things uh, smoothly continued. And I'm not taking. I'm, I'm not talking about the Jewish problem as such, but I'm, the whole the whole way of Vergangenheitsbewältigung, which which yeah. is such an important aspect to understand Germany. As, as, to, as to perpetrators, uh, many of them were incarcerated, so don't, uh, don't think that it was a smooth process, starting with Erich Milke, who was actually, who was actually sentenced for a murder committed in the 1930s, uh, 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 killing two Prussian uh, police officers. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, I'll, I'm going to go to the second part of your comment first and then to the first because it's really substantial. Um, I think that yes, some people were jailed, but a lot of people, and especially this group, which is a very particular group, we have to say this is not a generalizable thing, this is a very particular group of people. A lot of these people also still feel that people who uh, had collaborated with the Stasi many of them actually continued, even up until the present day, to benefit from their actions. So some people, it, there was very explicit collaboration shown, then some people uh, were, were imprisoned, but actually most people benefited and, and the legacy of those benefits continue up until the present day. That's number one. Number two, the small question of the Third Reich in Germany. Well, let's deal with it right here. Um, uh, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's, it's, it's a really um, key, th what can I say, theme. That, and I want to say two things about it. One is that the comparison uh, between the dictatorship of East Germany and the Third Reich is something which this group of people feel deeply offended by, okay? And we could have a long conversation about that, but they feel that, that it loses its nuance because people say you have dictatorship here, you have fascism here, and they're all the same. And for them, their very country was actually built on fighting fascism, okay? We know that. Um, and their whole idea. Now, what I want to say, rather than going down that road, because it's quite a long one, what I want to say is that the people who are like Annette Simon's age, okay, these what I call the GDR babies, the ones who were born just after the formation of the country in the late 40s after the war, those people actually have said to me, a lot of the, my generational work has been with those people who say to me, we had too much respect for our parents' generation because they were anti-fascist fighters. And so therefore, we felt silenced able, and able to say, in, in our ability to be able to say to them a critique of the authoritarian state. And their shame is how long they waited to do that. 
okay? So I look at people like this and I see a lot of bravery and the courage that they did and da, 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 da. They look at themselves and they said, we had far too much respect for our parents' generation who were the anti-fascist fighters. Now, we know very well. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not, but this is not a comparative study. This is not, I mean, if I was doing West German work, it's, it's different as well. I'm really just talking about how these people understood um, what they were doing. Yes, they were, um, but they felt, they would argue that their, their country exists for that reason. Now, one of the interesting things and one of the really sad horrors is even in the early 90s when I was there, and you'd be traveling alone in the East and you hear these, you know, you see the, it wasn't as obvious then as it is now, but it was still apparent and it was already frightening. And I have to say, by the way, I, I am Jewish and I would be traveling alone at night and you see these young guys and they've got swastikas and they are, and it's really scary, right? And they are singing all these songs. And it's like, really, did that just rise up in the last two years? because I don't think so. And how is it that all those people actually are singing the very same songs that were sung during fascist times? I don't think, I think they learned them someplace. I don't think just because they weren't singing them in public spaces doesn't mean they weren't hearing them in the home. And I think what is very upsetting about what's going on now is we see the deep rootedness of that. So I think it's a, it's a really, really important question and it's, um, I certainly don't mean to undermine it at all, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Molly. That's been a huge talk, a uh, lot of, lot of, lot of think, uh, food for thought. Uh, I lived most of the 90s in Berlin was a neighbor of Ulrike Poppe and many oh, others. Oh, right. Yeah, and um, so actually this is a more of a comment uh, because I think that all the time people are talking about forgiving and mm -hmm. the different forms that who should be forgiving to whom and, and why because there are many people who still today feel that they were victims or victimized and so on. So I think this is a excellent, excellent work. Thank you for that. But then a little thing that I wanted to ask you about, because somehow when you were talking about the comparison with the South African case, I was uh, reminded of a talk show, a TV show that was run in Germany in the 92, 93, 94, I don't remember which year, where they were kind of getting people who were victims of Stasi and then the perpetrators together in the talk show. And there was, for example, I remember that there was this one couple, like the husband and the wife, and they were the other one had been kind of um, surveilling the other. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. I don't remember wife or the husband. Vera Volenberg. I don't remember anymore, but yeah. it was the most crazy show where you know that you were watching and eating popcorn and seeing these people to tell each other. Yeah that, uh, you know, I was married to you for 30 years and all the time I was spying on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to hear yeah. your comment because cool. I, I had forgotten about that. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's really, really interesting. I think the case you're talking about there is Vera Volenberg and her husband, Knud, they were kind because of, she was a member of parliament as well. Um, but anyway, there were some really pretty obscene things. Okay, I'm going to give the example of the Tater Up Fair victim victimizer talks, which were at Checkpoint Charlie. Now, Vern Werner Fisher told me that he participated in one of these with his, with, with his Stasi interrogator. Now, one of the things he said to me was the Stasi was really smart. You know, they, they, they actually paired you with someone who in another life you might have been really friends with. You know, he was, and he said the really strange thing is that this guy knew everything about me, but I knew nothing about him. And in fact, I'll just sidetrack and then come back to this public scene. He actually said that, um, he said the only thing I could tell about him is that he was married because he had a wedding ring and that he liked ties because he always wore a different tie. And he told the story of actually being in Herod's. This is like an alternative universe, right? He tells the story of being in, in Herod's with Berbo Bolai and walking through the men's section and seeing and thinking, oh, my I am would love this tie, like almost like I should get him a present, right? 
strange. So um, anyway, he does go back to, uh, you know, to, when he can, then uh, to East Berlin. And he does, in fact, participate in one of those talks with this guy. And he says to him, the guy says to him, you know, we should be friends. OK, you and I, they loved us. We were a great act. They loved us. And Fisher was so appalled by this. He was like, "In what?" And the guy actually want, he he proposed to him that they do a road show because they were a more, one of the more successful ones. And he's like, "Yeah." So I did actually see one of those um, with Petra Kelly actually and uh, Templin. There was actually a group of them there. It was. Uh, this was not quite the same kind of uh, slapstick kind of show, but it was weird. Like you're sitting there listening to these people and I'm kind of thinking, well, what, what is my role here? Like listening to this, it was kind of strange. But anyway, um, I think that I, I didn't hear of any positive uh, reactions to those encounters. They weren't very meaningful and I don't think I say meaningful in terms of allowing a space where there could be more detailed conversations. And my only uh, detailed conversation was with Werner Fischer about it, who said, I will never do that again. The idea that we're going to be a walking, talking road show is not OK.